Hi everyone and welcome to lecture eight in this lecture series on foundations of blockchains. The topic for this lecture is going to be longest chain consensus. In the last lecture, lecture seven, we studied the Tendermint protocol uh, and proved its basic consistency and liveness properties. Uh, and that lecture was really the culmination of a six lecture sequence uh, in which we mastered the fundamentals of distributed computing as laid out um, by the brilliant computer scientists that preceded us uh, back in the 1980s. And, you know, personally, I think it's really cool that these classic ideas, you know, from several decades ago, uh, manifest in modern blockchain protocols. You know, Tendermint, uh, as we discussed, uh, is the driving force behind uh, some projects you may have heard of, like, say, Cosmos or Terra. And it's actually not just Tendermint. There's other blockchain protocols out there you might have heard of that also have a similar flavor. Uh, so Algorand would be another example. I mean, it differs in lots of details, but still from a, from a high level, it has the flavor of iterated Byzantine agreement, much in the spirit of Tendermint. Hot Stuff, which is the proposed consensus protocol uh, for Facebook's uh, cryptocurrency, once that's rolled out, that also sort of has the flavor of a pipelined uh, version of Tendermint. And finally, some parts of the proposed consensus protocol for Ethereum 2.0, once they switch to uh, proof of stake, also resemble some of the ideas we've been discussing here. So all of these protocols involve, you know, sort of rounds of voting, you know, and nodes only committing to a block once they've seen, um, you know, some number of successful votes for it. All of these protocols also share the same trade-offs that Tendermint made as far as what to do when under attack, like a network partition or denial of service attack, uh, or in the asynchronous phase of the partially synchronous model. Uh, namely, all of these protocols uh, favor consistency, potentially at the expense of liveness uh, during a network partition. So that's great. We've both mastered this sort of classical area of computer science and also seen how it manifests in lots of today's blockchain protocols. But you know, as you probably know, uh, you know, at least the most famous blockchains out there in the world, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, the way it works today, they actually use consensus protocols that kind of do not at all resemble what we've been talking about thus far. So there are really two different dominant paradigms um, for the design of consensus protocols in the blockchain world. One of those paradigms is the one we've been discussing thus far, exemplified by Tendermint. Uh, you often hear these types of protocols referred to as BFT protocols or BFT type protocols. Here, BFT stands for Byzantine Fault Tolerant, which of course is what we've been studying for the last large number of lectures. Now, the first shared property um, of these protocols is they all look sort of similar, at least from sort of 30,000 feet. So in particular, uh, you typically see multiple stages of voting uh, to ensure that a node will only commit to a block uh, when it knows that all the other nodes will commit to that same block as well. So these protocols are designed so that, you know, as long as you don't have too many Byzantine nodes, um, there's no situation under which um, you'll break consistency. Okay, so really they favor consistency even in the face of an attack, even in the asynchronous phase uh, of the partially synchronous model. So these protocols are designed so that they never have forks, they never have two different confirmed blocks at the same block height. Uh, on the other hand, if they do ever encounter a fork, right, either because the software is buggy or because more than a third of the nodes are Byzantine or whatever, uh, it's actually very difficult for these types of protocols to resolve that ambiguity and, re and resolve the fork. So, for example, if you look at the documentation for Tendermint Core, I mean, they literally say that if you wind up having a, a fork in your blockchain, um, you should sort of resort to human coordination via Internet media, right? Which you should think to mean something like, you know, a Discord server where all the people running the protocol maybe go and kind of figure out, um, you know, what they should all do. So with these BFT type protocols, um, forks and the ambiguity they introduce, they are extremely difficult uh, to resolve inside the protocol itself. And for that reason, uh, they're designed with the idea that forks will literally never happen. So that's a short summary of both what BFT protocols tend to look like and also what properties uh, they tend to have. One thing I, I meant to add when I was talking about ensuring consistency uh, always, assuming less than 33% Byzantine nodes, sort of a consequence this, of this is that, you know, the failure mode uh, for a BFT type protocol like, say, Tendermint uh, is to stall. So whenever you kind of see like a popular article about um, some issue with some BFT type protocol, you know, whether it was a bug or whether it was an attack, you know, generally what you'll read about is that the blockchain just kind of did nothing. Okay, there were that no transactions were executed for some long period of time, you know, 20 hours or whatever. You do not with these with these protocols, for example, usually hear about transactions getting rolled back, double spend attacks, that sort of thing. All right, so that's category number one. I mean, if you've even sort of watched a 20 minute video on Bitcoin at some point in your life, you kind of already know there's a category number two. The other main type are longest chain protocols. Again, with the canonical example here, 
uh, being Bitcoin. Ethereum, at least right now, also is a longest chain protocol. So we'll talk in detail about how these um, work on, starting on the next slide. You know, but just as a, as a quick intro, in longest chain protocols, uh, actually the philosophy is to embrace forks. So as a result, you're not going to need these sort of explicit stages of voting. Um, rather, you're going to let forks happen as part of normal operation. Uh, but then, of course, you don't want to spin up a Discord server every time that happens. So you want to have an in-protocol method for resolving the ambiguities posed by forks. And that's going to be a longest chain rule. So this idea of just allowing forks and resolving them within the protocol, uh, this is a very, this is actually a quite radical idea. I, I'm not aware of um, any consensus protocol that took this approach prior to the release of the Bitcoin white paper uh, at the end of 2008. Now, by virtue of sort of allowing forks and resolving them within the protocol, longest chain protocols also make a different trade-off as far as what properties they retain while under attack, for example, when there's a network partition. Uh, specifically, unlike classical 20th century protocols, longest chain protocols actually favor liveness uh, over consistency. And because of this, uh, they have sort of a different failure mode under attack. So when you hear about problems with the longest chain protocol, you usually don't hear that, you know, no transactions were processed for 24 hours. What you usually hear are about big reorganizations of the chain, uh, which means the transactions, which everybody thought were confirmed, actually wind up getting rolled back once the attack concludes. If you want to read about some sort of, you know, real world examples of exactly these types of attacks, of these sort of large scale reorganizations of a longest chain protocol, I encourage you to uh, go search about Ethereum Classic, which has been uh, attacked in this way several times. So one bummer about these big chain reorganizations is that they can uh, enable what are called double spend attacks. Whenever there's a big chain reorganization, in effect, a lot of transactions that people thought were finalized or confirmed uh, get rolled back and invalidated. Uh, so that means, you know, if there is some transaction that purchased a physical good, like, you know, maybe an expensive one like a Tesla, uh, and the person has already driven off with a Tesla, and then that payment gets rolled back, well, that's a pretty big bummer for the, for the car dealer. And so because longest chain protocols um, are the ones that suffer these big sort of chain reorganizations, or the ones that actually wind up rolling back transactions um, after an attack, uh, those are the blockchains that you tend to hear about uh, double spend attacks, not so much the BFT type protocols. Now, before we wrap up this video, let me emphasize, it's not the case that literally 100% of the consensus protocols out there in the blockchain world fall into one of these two categories. A lot of them do. I didn't do an exact count. You know, I would guess like 70%, 80%, something like that. There are a few exceptions, and we may cover one or two of those uh, in a future lecture. But certainly, these two categories will allow you to classify most of the major blockchain protocols that are out there. I'm mostly done with what I want to tell you about BFT type protocols. We've obviously already had a number of lectures on them. Uh, so now it's time to look at this 21st and century, century invention, uh, longest chain protocols. So I'll tell you exactly how those work starting in the next video. I'll see you there.